Welcome to Sardar TV. I'm Vaishali Jain. We have the pleasure of having Andrew Yang with us today. Andrew is an entrepreneur and founder of Venture for America and the author of the book titled Smart People Should Build Things, and he's here to tell us more. Andrew, thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. So your book starts out by saying we've got a problem. Our smart people are doing the wrong things. Tell us more about your book. My book's called Smart People Should Build Things, and it was born out of a decade or more of my career. Uh, so when I, I graduated from Brown in the mid-90s, I'd studied economics. I didn't know what to do, so I went to law school, which is one of the things you did if you didn't know what to do at that time. Uh, and I found the people at law school, really, none of us had any idea why we were there. Maybe some of us pretended. And then uh, law school clarified very little about one's path in life, and so I became a corporate attorney here in New York. And I found it was a bad fit, so uh, I then left to start an ill-fated company during the first dot-com bubble uh, that didn't do well, it failed. And then the question I faced then is a question the book tries to address, which is how do you develop young people to become entrepreneurs instead of lawyers? Uh, since I, I tried to be an entrepreneur, it didn't work out so well. And so uh, I then uh, learned from a more experienced entrepreneur and went on to become the CEO of a company. So, so the book is about how we're channeling way too many of our smart young people to uh, law, finance, consulting, um, grad school, and other fields, and not driving them to early stage companies that will end up uh, creating jobs and opportunities throughout the economy. Who is the target audience for your book? Who would benefit most from reading it? Who would enjoy reading it most? You know, I, I think a lot of people can relate uh, because I talk to hundreds of young people and they feel this real pressure to uh, achieve, succeed, find the path forward. But we live in an era where the paths forward are not as predictable and certain as they used to be. I mean, you look at the, the big five paths for smart college graduates today. Law school has fallen out of favor. Uh, Bloomberg Business Week projects 176,000 unemployed or underemployed law school graduates by 2020, so that's not what it used to be. Doctors are consistently characterizing medicine as not what it used to be in terms of the career path. Grad school uh, academic positions are constricting. So you have young people that really badly want to find a path forward, but then the traditional paths, uh, they, they have greater and greater uncertainty about. So I'd say any young person who's trying to figure it out, uh, trying to figure out their career and the path forward. So let's talk a little bit more about your book. Part one of your book details our current system of allocating talent, where our top graduates go to work, and what they're doing, and why it's not leading the country towards the direction we should be going in. Tell us more about this. So there are six big paths for smart college kids today. Uh, financial services, management consulting, law school, med school, grad school, and Teach for America. And these six paths will comprise between 50 and 65 percent of college graduates and will direct them disproportionately to just a handful of markets. New York, San Francisco, D.C., Boston, Chicago, and L.A. So we have tons of talent going to professional services and graduate programs that aren't directly influencing job creation at the ground floor, which is these early stage companies, and not enough talent heading towards uh, companies that can grow to become the, the next generation of, of uh, Fortune 500. So the metaphor I use is that we're spreading a lot of our talent like icing and then not baking the cake. Where if you have a really smart kid who goes to become a banker, consultant, or lawyer, they're typically serving very mature companies that are trying to do complex deals. Uh, and mature companies tend to be just about uh, zero net job creators. They'll hire, they'll fire, but they'll more or less, Fortune 500, the employment stats if you look at them are actually constant. So if you want job growth, what you want is those smart young people going to really small new firms that have 5, 15, 50 employees and trying to grow them uh, to become 500 or 5,000 employees in cities around the country too because we can't just be pumping all of our talent into uh, New York, Silicon Valley, and D.C. Um, because that, that's, it's not good for anyone. It's not good for those people, uh, the society, or the economy. So with so many of our top graduates going into professional services like banking and law, your book outlines why this isn't a good thing for job growth. Tell us more about that. One of the things that I've gotten feedback on the book is that people who've gone to certain schools say, wow, this describes my experience completely to a T. And then other people who've gone to other schools say, like, wow, I really had no idea that was going on. <laughs> so what's happened, uh, unbeknownst to a lot of people, is that there's this massive war for talent where certain firms, Google, McKinsey, uh, Facebook, uh, JP Morgan, places like that, 
spend tens of millions of dollars recruiting hundreds, thousands of young people every year. Uh, Teach for America, which is one of the largest recruiters of national college university graduates, spends $38 million on recruitment and selection alone in the last year record. So if you extrapolate that over all of the major banks, consulting firms, and tech firms, you're looking at maybe hundreds of millions of dollars being spent directing young people to very specific places. So policymakers and uh, you know people who are looking at this, they think that a 21, 22 year old is somehow like thinking about what field they want to go into and saying like, oh, I like, you know, uh, journalism or I, I like finance or something like that. But the, the truth is that from the time they're juniors in college, they're being bombarded with uh, resources. One firm spends so much on recruiting that they'll pay uh, college students $100 to tell them why they chose not to participate in the, in the process. That's not like $100 come to my firm. It's like $100 just to talk to me about why you didn't come to my firm. So. Uh, what our young people are, are, are doing is just a subject to how much is invested in recruiting them. And the sooner we open our eyes to that and then engage meaningfully in what that means for different regions, for the economy, for society as a whole, uh, the better off we'll be. Your book made a point about, yes, there needs to be more entry points for young graduates to actually become entrepreneurs at yes. the university level, yes. at the graduate level, yes. you know, government support. but. There is a bit of a mindset issue when it comes to, when you go beyond that, right? When you look at yeah, upbringings and what are the expectations from your parents, <laughs> yeah, yeah. right? And so, so the mindset is one thing, but the resources is another. Like if I teach a person in college to value certain things, let's say I tell them go change the world or like do something really idealistic. And then the graduation speech happens and they go out into the world and then who's there waiting for them? The, really the question is who's there <laughs> waiting for them? They can have a mindset oriented towards idealism, but if the only m options they're being given are banking, consulting, <laughs> like, then that's what they're going to do. So what, what my organization, Venture for America, does is it gives them a concrete option to come join Venture for America, and we will train them. We will bring in McKinsey and IDEO to train them for five weeks, and then they will go work at a startup in Detroit, Baltimore, New Orleans, St. Louis, uh, another city around the country, They'll work there for two years. They'll either become a manager and leader at that company, and then great. Um, or if they want to start their own company, we have an accelerator and seed fund to help them do that. So it's not about changing a mindset. It's about actually putting resources to work. Uh, the comparison I draw, and I went to law school, and, and you know, I mean, I, there are a lot of unhappy lawyers I know. <laughs> but if you're, if you're a young person, you don't know what to do, and you decide to go to law school, your parents will think it's a great idea it's easy to find, you don't have to like, you know, figure it out. Uh, and the government will give you a $100,000 loan, no questions asked. If you want to start your own business, your parents will think it's a terrible idea. It's super hard to find. And no one's going to give you a $100,000 loan. So that, and meanwhile, the, the law school industrial complex is being subsidized by the government to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars in loans per year. And we're churning out lawyers that the economy doesn't need. <laughs> and there's an equivalent shortage of entrepreneurs starting businesses around the country. So that's a very long-winded way of saying it's not about the mindset, it's about creating equivalent choices. So I certainly didn't mean to diminish that a mindset is very important. Uh, so one thing I, I like to point out to is, is that entrepreneurship education programs, degrees, certificates, departments, have quadrupled in the last 20 years. It's all the rage on college campuses around the country. If you look at uh, actual private company ownership among 18 to 30 year olds, it's gone down by 40% in the same 20 years. So entrepreneurship education way up, actual business ownership and entrepreneurship way down. <laughs> so, so those things have inverse relationships. And, uh, and I've dug into this a little bit, and a uh, joke I tell is that if an entrepreneurship professor were to be honest, he would show up on day one and say, half of you are going to fail this class and at the end of the class, I'm going to determine that in part by rolling dice at random. Uh, and if a professor were to say that, then no one would show up for his class because every student would be like, well, I'm certainly not going like, to take that chance on, on failing. Um, but that's what actual entrepreneurship would look like in terms of outcomes because you know, uh, a majority of businesses will fail, uh, particularly you know, if, if someone's uh, inexperienced from the get-go. So 
so that's one. Uh, you know, another thing is, you, you know, if they showed up, they could say, hey, I'll come back in three months and see what you did. I mean, <laughs> like that, that would also be a pretty accurate depiction. Uh, so we need to create a culture that will actually accept failure. And our academic environment does not do that at all. Uh, you know, if you look at college environment, if you get an F, that's a zero in your GPA, it will like submarine it immediately. You like won't get into any graduate programs, have a hard time getting jobs. So that's our system. You know, you certainly are not going to get into a really selective college if you have a high school transcript dotted with Fs. <laughs> you know, it's like, so we're, we're not rewarding failure. We have like a lockstep system that has people graduating from college having done virtually nothing in a non-school environment by the time they're 22. Uh, and so then it's logical for them to just try and figure out the next step. So if we were to want to change the mindset, we'd have to start early and say it's okay to fail, it's okay to try something you're going to be terrible at and just use it as a learning experience. It's okay to have some free time and freedom. And it's okay to not go straight through school. Like it's okay to have gap years. The more we can get the world outside of the classroom into the system before someone graduates from college, the better. So that's co-op programs in college, that's gap years before college. Uh, that that's uh, work uh, throughout uh, the school year. Anything like that pushes in the right direction. So how is that done? How do you create equivalent choices? What is the government's role in this process? What are universities' roles in this process? What needs to be done? So the government is funding just about all of these paths, either directly or indirectly. So I talked about Teach for America's $40 million recruitment budget. The government gives Teach for America $80 million a year out of its $200 million budget. So they're saying like, hey, you know, it's a great idea teaching. And, you know, we can say that's probably uh, a good thing. Uh, they're subsidizing law school uh, loans, again, hundreds of millions of dollars a year. You could argue that might be a little bit excessive. <laughs> med school, uh, all federally funded. Uh, you know, med, med schools uh, essentially um, have like massive tax breaks and, and research uh, dollars. Uh, grad schools the same way. So what policymakers need to do is they need to, to look at what they're incentivizing and what they're not incentivizing and either pull back on one or invest in the other. On the college side, truthfully, most colleges don't do a great job of figuring out what happens after people graduate. They have a career services office that primarily just receives incoming interest. Uh, you know, so the career services office at um, you know, Duke just has a bunch of banks consulting firms there hanging out being like, hey, you know, love Duke students. And then the career services people are like, great. So uh, universities should invest meaningful dollars in, in rewarding and incentivizing people heading down directions that might uh, be good for society. I mean, someplace like Harvard, uh, you know, their, their tax exempt status uh, accounts for like billions of dollars in, in tax breaks. They have an endowment of $40 billion. Um, and they're actually doing this a little bit where if you're a Harvard undergrad and you work for a startup and document it, um, Harvard will actually give you money to pay your living expenses. So there, there are schools that are starting to tiptoe in this direction, but they need to go much, much further. Do you think this is the reason why there are so few entrepreneurs coming out of college? Because you mentioned the number of entrepreneurship classes that are being offered yes. has increased, but the actual number of entrepreneurs coming out of college has decreased. So. Yeah, so, so entrepreneurship you classes, young people have told me that entrepreneurship classes actually discourage them because then they feel like there's this massive checklist of things that they have to like have done or figure out to start a business. Whereas in the old days, someone would just start selling, you know, t-shirts or tires or whatever and then they'd have a business before too long and there'd be no like wild like market sizing and, you know, uh, business plan writing and the rest of it. So that's something that um, you know, I find a little bit discouraging uh, about our approach to entrepreneurship in the classroom. Uh, that there need to be non-academic uh, non uh, stakes, if you will. There needs to be real money. And it goes back to what I'd said before about resources, that if you have like a, if you get an A, you know, in the end of the day, that doesn't really matter. But if someone had real money on the line, um, then everyone would take it a whole lot more seriously. The, you know, another thing I'll say, and I, I love entrepreneurship professors, um, virtually all of them are really um, positive uh, influences and, and good people, but I find entrepreneurship classes much more uh, compelling when the professor is an operator or someone who's run a business, and that is generally not the case. Uh, like oftentimes, people who are running entrepreneurship classes um, 
haven't actually done that. And not, not a knock on them, I mean, you know. But it, it is something uh, that I've seen that makes a difference. So we talk about instruction. Let's say I were to uh, teach a class on how to raise $2 million. And I could give you like a step-by-step, -step, blow by blow, here's exactly what you do, and how to teach 100 people. At the end of that class, how many of them could actually go out and raise $2 million? Maybe like 1% of them, maybe 2%. And, and that 1% or 2% probably had a rich family, <laughs> <You know? laughs> honestly. So that, that's like one of the problems with trying to teach entrepreneurship, is that it's not like a, um, it, it's more of like an action and uh, interfacing with the world than it is like a discrete set of skills. So we need to get more people taking action um, for real enterprises and organizations, uh, really to, to develop in that direction. So it's useful when you have this sort of perspective to figure out, okay, so this is the American system. If you're a really good student, odds of you graduating from college straight are like 89, 89%, 90%, something like that. So who's doing something different and how does it work out? And the big example in this space is Israel, which has, by any measure, the highest level of entrepreneurship in uh, any developed country in the world, uh, higher late rates of venture capital, higher uh, IPOs per capita than anyone else. So what they do is they have mandatory military service before college and so by the time you graduate from college you're like 25 and you're an adult and you're impatient and you're like alright let's go and do this thing. So they, and, and they've operated in a non-hierarchical environment, the military, for a couple of years with diverse sets of people and so then they're, they're just ready to go. Uh, one of the things that science tells us is that our brains don't finish wiring until we're between 25 and 30. So the Israelis, by the time they graduate from college, they're essentially mature adults. In our case, we graduate when we're 22, if we're lucky. Um, and then uh, what happens in those next several years ends up becoming hugely formative in terms of our identity, our way of thinking. So we either have to get experiences earlier uh, in the process, or what Venture for America is doing, obviously, is we're just uh, supplementing post-college. What are some of the ramifications of this if, if this trend continues in the U.S., if our top graduates continue going to these professional services and we don't see more um, job growth coming out of entrepreneurship? What, what have you found in your You know, I mean, research? I've spent time all over the country, and, and like the, the danger is, to me, really um, pervasive in that if you have smart people heading to the same firm, same industries, same cities, you end up with a very bifurcated society. And it gets uh, harder and harder for someone to go someplace else and uh, build a business if they're um, struggling to attract talent uh, to that environment. One of the things that is new to this generation is this uh, social media fueled uh, FOMO, fear of missing out. So if you're a young person now, and you went to a good school, and then you moved to uh, Detroit and start a business, in the old days, you'd probably just be like figuring out what to do. And today, you're bombarded by these social media messages um, and images of your friends uh, in New York and Silicon Valley, and they're like living, you know, high on the hog. And then you, every day, you're probably looking at it being like interesting. I mean, I, if it were me, I'd just turn it off. <laughs> but when you talk about what the long-term consequences are, they're economic, they're cultural, um, you end up with very much this land of like the haves and have-nots. I mean, I, you know, earlier this year I went from Cleveland to San Francisco and the differences are stark. You know, it, it's, uh, um, and if you only spend your time in certain environments like uh, San Francisco, then you end up with a very different sense of the world. And if that's what our elites uh, and smart people are universally um, internalizing as the way the world works, then it's going to end up um, again with, with a very bifurcated society. Are you yourself working with universities and you know, policy makers to create change? Well, um, let, let me say that uh, universities love us because we're a diverse uh, pro-social option for their graduates. Uh, so they embrace us and you know, whenever they can. Um, I, I'm obviously something of an impatient sort, so if you wanted to solve this problem, which I, I 
passionately do. Instead of lobbying the government to do something, I just started an organization and was like, all right, let's just do it. You know, let's give them the choice, let's invest resources. So, you know, I put in 120K of my own to seed the organization and our budget was 200K in, in 2011. This year our budget's around 5 million or so. Includes support from Reed Hoffman, Dan Gilbert, Jeff Weiner, Graham Weston, UBS, PwC, Blackstone, Barclays, Bank of America. Uh, so we're going to try our best to solve the problem and create this choice. Last year we had 1,500 applicants for about 120 spots. So there's real demand on the talent side. You can see that. Uh, and if we were to grow big enough, then we could do something meaningful about this. I mean, we have 50 Venture for America fellows and alums in Detroit, many of whom are starting businesses, 36 in New Orleans, 35 in Baltimore, 35 in Philadelphia. So it's starting to amount to significant numbers. And these are kids with a wide array of other options. I mean, these are graduates of uh, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Princeton, Caltech, MIT, Brown, where I went, Duke, Penn, like all of it. And so we can do something. Venture for America can do something about it. If I were to lobby the government about this, we'd be waiting like forever and then we'd all die, truthfully. Like I've, I've visited now, I've met the president twice, five senators, you know, an equivalent number of congressmen, and the, the takeaway I've gotten from my meetings has been let's just do this thing ourselves uh, because, you know, like lobbying is, is not a productive use of time. As an example in your book, you make a point about how some of the most productive people we know, like Mark Zuckerberg, Michael Dell, if they had gone into professional services, the world we'd be living in today would be very different. So can you tell us li a little bit more about what their contributions have been to the economy and maybe some statistics that you might have come across in your research around that? Growth companies account for approximately two thirds of new net jobs uh, in the economy. And uh, you can take someone like Michael Dell who literally showed up at UT Austin planning on going to med school. He, even down the stretch after he'd started Dell out of his dorm room, he was still like, should I go be a doctor? Now it seems ridiculous because obviously he should have <laughs> been an entrepreneur and started Dell. And you know, Dell just bought EMC and like the, I think it's the largest tech deal in history. I mean, it's like a $37 billion deal or something um, staggering. So Dell alone, if you were to go down to Austin, you see it accounts for thousands of jobs, um, thousands of other jobs around the world, billions of dollars in commerce, and uh, a way that, and obviously, you know, we all like physicians, but imagine if he, senior year in UT Austin, had like taken his MCATs and then gone and gone to med school, uh, you know? And, and med school, the way it's designed is that if I go to med school next year, it doesn't even mean there's one more doctor. It means that if I get in there, I just dislodged another doctor who, or aspiring doctor in that case, because there's a, a defined set of med school slots and residency slots every year. So I'm not even creating another doctor. It's just the difference between me and the person who would have been a doctor but never got in. Um, so if Michael Dell becomes a doctor, that's not even one more doctor. <laughs> it just means it's the difference between like this doctor and the, the you know. So look at that value gap, the, the gap between thousands of jobs around the country, billions of dollars in, in uh, um, commerce versus the difference between like Michael Dell and the worst, because I'm sure Michael Dell would have gotten into med school if, if he decided to do so. You know, it, it makes me think of an economy like Greece, where in Greece for decades they told their educated people become doctors and lawyers. But then when the bottom fell out of uh, their industrial base, no one can pay for uh, health care or legal services and the doctors and lawyers. You know, it's like the professional services generally are beneficiaries of growth but they do not drive growth, typically. If you have like an outstanding healthcare facility, then it could be you draw in um, patients and resources from outside, but that's highly unusual. For the most part, uh, these industries are service industries that, uh, that only can exist and prosper if there is existing commerce uh, to support them. So tell us more about Venture for America, which you founded, yes. and why you decided to start this. How did you come up with the idea? I became the CEO of an education company called Manhattan GMAT, uh, and we help people get into business school. So I personally taught the analyst classes at Goldman Sachs, McKinsey, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, and I encountered hundreds of very smart, very ambitious young people who uh, weren't that excited about what they were doing. Uh, you could tell because they were taking the GMAT to go to business school to 
figure it out and hit the reset button and take out a lot of loans and take a break. And so I saw it over and over again and it reminded me of me at Davis Polk, the law firm, where I was there and I was like, what am I even doing here? And so I thought like, wow, this really should be improved on because these are some very high potential, high achieving young people. Uh, at the same time, I was heavily exposed to Teach for America, which had successfully channeled thousands of young people to uh, needy schools around the country. And so I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if there was a Teach for America for entrepreneurship in places like Detroit and Baltimore and St. Louis? And so I thought, yeah, that would be great. I, well, what would you call that organization? And so not being very Im imaginative, I said, Venture for America. It seems like very uh, wholesome. <laughs> So my company was acquired by the Washington Post in 2009, and so I then said someone should start Venture for America, and I decided that I would do it. So uh, I put down some, some seed money myself and then launched in 2011, and uh, I'm happy to say we've grown every year and, and, uh, and achieved a lot in the last four years. Tell us more about your achievements and, and how the um, recruitment process works. So if anyone watching this, uh, knows any smart, enterprising, aspiring entrepreneurs that are recent college graduates or college seniors, please do have them apply to Venture for America. Last year we had 1,500 applicants from around the country and the application is fairly straightforward, just go online. Um, we have recruitment events at campuses around the country to drum up interest. Uh, there's actually a major documentary being shot on us right now that's going to come out next year so that I'm sure will drive applications. Uh, so that's the talent piece. Uh, enterprising, ambitious, recent college graduates apply, we recruit them, we get hundreds of applications, we then go through them and uh, really try and identify people that we're excited about, not just in terms of um, abilities and skills, but also values and character. So if you get in, we then have a training camp for five weeks at Brown University with uh, top firms like McKinsey and IDEO and Flatiron School. We put you in teams, you make best friends with each other, uh, and then at the end of this training camp, which people enjoy the heck out of, you then go to work in a startup in one of these cities for two years. And at the end of the two years, then again, you can become a manager and leader or you can potentially start your own firm. So the recruitment process really is just by trying to get the word out, put resources into it, uh, telling young people, look, if you want to become an entrepreneur, we will help you do that. We will give you the training, the network, prestige, the community, the optionality, the exposure, all the things that you think you need to go to a big firm to get, we will give it to you in order to make, again, an equivalent choice. It's not like, hey, go do this thing and then um, we're going to you know, make it super difficult uh, on you. The thing that frustrates me so much is that um, it's like all these, these talented young people and we're saying to them, hey, here are these six choices. What we really want you to do is the seventh thing we're hiding behind our back and going to make hard. Um, but here are these six things. <laughs> so what we just have to give them the seventh thing and the eighth thing and the 81st thing. Just give them more genuine choices and make them uh, rewarded, prestigious. Uh, give them the training and network and community and support and investment they want. And what cities and industries generally um, do you place these young graduates? So we are up to 15 cities. Um, I can list them. It's fun. It's, it's always fun for me. Detroit. New Orleans, Providence, Cincinnati, Baltimore, Cleveland, Philadelphia, Miami, Denver, Pittsburgh, Birmingham, uh, Columbus, San Antonio. So the companies they work at are about half tech oriented. Uh, so one company in Cleveland is called Genome Oncology. It does cancer uh, treatment software that person like sequences your DNA and then figures out what your customized treatment should be if you have cancer. Um, so companies like that, that I'm happy to say are solving really diverse problems because the way companies get started is that they get born of what these communities um, have resources dedicated to and also the problems that they see. So uh, genome oncology, Cleveland Clinic is one of the foremost cancer treatment centers in the country, so you know, like that, that would be a very sensible place for it to, to be started. Um, you know, Baltimore also has a ton of healthcare and cybersecurity companies. New Orleans has a ton of education because it's the only uh, school in the U.S. with majority charter. So you see that the companies are actually very diverse, about half tech, half otherwise. 
and uh, the fellows end up working in a variety of roles across them. From where have you received funding? How have you raised money for your venture? So our, our budget of five million comes uh, from our corporate partners. So again, that's uh, organizations like uh, UBS, PwC, Barclays, Blackstone, Bank of America. Um, and then we receive another couple million from major entrepreneurs, individuals, partners, and foundations in our cities. So that's Dan Gilbert, Graham Weston, the Knight Foundation, the Walton Foundation, the Abel Foundation, and uh, organizations like that. And then uh, another million or so from our board members, our generous donors individually, um, uh, and individuals across the country like Jeff Weiner, the CEO of LinkedIn, uh, Dara Khazrashahi, the CEO of Expedia, uh, people like that ha have also uh, been big supporters because they believe in the potential of entrepreneurship to help uh, revitalize the country. Tell us about some of those um, successes and how do you measure the impacts of what you're doing on the cities that yes. some of these uh, students and fellows have gone to work in? So our, our goal is to help create U.S. job growth. Uh, and we think it's really straightforward how you do that. First, you help supply talent to early stage companies so that they can grow and succeed. And two, you train a critical mass of your top prospects to become business builders and job creators as opposed to contract editors and uh, like transaction experts and the, the rest of it. <laughs> you like, turn them into builders. So to date, uh, our partner companies have grown by about 1,250 jobs, um, so that is fellows showed up and then they continued to grow. Um, and then our fellows themselves have started uh, businesses that have created an additional 50 jobs or so and raised about two and a half million. So of our 100 plus alums to date, 25% have founded or co-founded a business, which we think is shockingly high given that we're taking 22 year old recent college graduates and we have them for you know, two years. That's a very high bar. And the remaining 75%, the majority of them are managers at an early stage company in either their original city or another VFA city. So we're looking at a success rate of 75%, which is outlandishly high. That's how we measure success. What's your vision for Venture of America? What do you hope to accomplish, let's say, 10 years from now? Well, Venture for America has a three-part mission. It's to revitalize American cities and communities through entrepreneurship, enable our best and brightest to create new opportunities for themselves and others, and to restore the culture of achievement to include value creation, risk and reward, and the common good. So I would be very, very happy if 10 years from now um, we have hundreds of fellows and alums around the country starting companies, being pro-social managers and leaders at organizations all across the spectrum. So that's not just businesses, it could be government, nonprofits, uh, education, and a lot of them have those proclivities. Like they, they're really idealistic, uh, very admirable young people. Uh, and that it's a thriving community of people that help each other uh, to achieve great things uh, in, in those directions in terms of trying to um, revive the, the country and, and put in place a new set of role models so that if you have a young person at Dartmouth and right now, you know, the, the people at Dartmouth, it's like if you want to be uh, an ass kicker, you should go to Wall Street or McKinsey or, you know, Silicon Valley. And then you can say, or... What about that Dartmouth grad who then moved to New Orleans and started this enterprise, and then now that enterprise has uh, 50 or 100 employees and the person's doing great work? Is that worth emulating? Um, we believe it, it, it is, and we're going to make that possible by showing, by, by first drawing that young person in and then sending them back to campus um, five to ten years later to say, hey, look, I did it. And you can too, and it's not just an abstract like, hey, you can do it, and then I leave and, and go home and you never see me again. It's like you can apply to Venture for America if you get in. This organization will spend thirty-five dollars to $40,000 on, <laughs> on you to make this possible. Uh, and again, you can tell, like, you know, it's a recurring theme. It's like we're going to spend $100,000 creating a lawyer we don't need. <laughs> you know, we should spend thirty-five dollars to $40,000 creating an entrepreneur that can create you know, millions of dollars of value and hundreds of jobs. Tell us about some of your other entrepreneurial experiences before you started Venture for America and some of your successes, failures. Sure. And what you learned from them. Well, I was not a very enterprising kid. Um, my parents told me your job is to get good grades and go to a good school. So I tried to do that. And uh, 
I'd say that was actually my first really big experience in that direction was uh, co-founding a company. I was 25 and, and raising uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars. Uh, and that experience was extraordinarily difficult. Like when a guy sits and is interviewed and talks about starting a company, it sounds magical. Um, but what that meant in practice when I was 25 was you get a PowerPoint deck and you ask rich people for money and you get a lot of uh, negative responses. So that was my first major run. What kind of company was it? Uh, it was very dot-com 1.0. It was a fundraising company for a celebrity-affiliated nonprofit. It's called stargiving.com. It was based on something called a hunger site where you click to donate and then you're shown sponsors who donate money to the nonprofit and then one person gets to meet the celebrity who's invested in that nonprofit. Um, so we did eventually raise the money and then we went live and had like this press launch and I was on TV and some other stuff. So it was a phenomenal experience, but the company crashed and burned shortly thereafter when the bubble burst. So uh, I believe entrepreneurship is, uh, is incredibly difficult and uh, hard on people. It was very hard on me when the company failed. It took me, you know, maybe years <laughs> to feel truly confident and good about myself after that, because when you fail and fail publicly, it, it, it's tough. After that, I worked for a more experienced entrepreneur for a number of years, and I also started throwing parties on the side um, because I wanted to start a business that was cash flow positive from day one. And that was a great experience. You know, I've done fundraising for nonprofits I cared about, but the, the main entrepreneurial experiences I had were really um, as an adult. And so I, I can't say that I was one of those kids with the paper route or anything like that. So despite your startup failures, why did you decide to persevere and continue to be an entrepreneur? Well, one of the things that, as a theme that we try and get out there, is that uh, Bill Gates started a failed company before Microsoft called Trafo Data. Um, Henry Ford started a failed car company before Ford. Sam Walton started a failed retailer before Walmart. <laughs> like, like if any of those guys had, not that, I mean, obviously I'm like nowhere near the, the league of any of those people, but the theme is just that um, if you trace someone's steps, Virtually every entrepreneur failed a couple times out before whatever we know them for. Uh, and so that, that's another reason why I believe so strongly that we need to encourage our young people to be able to stumble and fall and get up um, because that's the only way something significant is going to be accomplished. So if you had to start your career over again, what would you do differently? I wouldn't have gone to law school. Um, not to say law school is a terrible thing. I mean, I got a lot out of it uh, intellectually. Um, but don't think that would be the thing to do. <laughs> uh, you know, I would have gotten involved with uh, um, a growth company uh, much earlier uh, in, in my career. And uh, the thing that entrepreneurship education cannot give you is confidence and self-belief and conviction. And if you have those things, then it opens a lot of doors, uh, as it turns out. So if I could do it over again, really the main thing is I would have tried to have had that conviction earlier. Um, you, you talk about Venture for America. I am 100% certain that the country needs a national entrepreneurship apprenticeship program that drives talent to cities around the country and not just these select places. And I will do everything in my power to make that a reality. And that's something that you grow into. So the, the key is for a young person to find something that they will believe in and invest in. And then uh, if they do fail, then uh, take that failure to heart. You probably won't have a choice. Um, but know that you can just get up and, uh, and do it again. What's your f least favorite and most favorite part about being an entrepreneur? Well, certainly one of the misconceptions I like to also get out there is that some misguided souls think that they want to be an entrepreneur to be their own boss. Um, you are never your own boss. Uh, if you're an entrepreneur, you're going to answer to your customers. You're going to answer to your team and employees. You're going to answer to your investors if you happen to have them. You're going to answer to everybody. So do not think that it's like, oh, I'm going to do what I want. You know, if you're effective, you're probably doing a lot of things you don't want to do. So my favorite thing in this context is that I, I'm doing something I believe in, I'm, uh, I'm passionate about, and like, you know, reflects my values. It's a rare thing. Um, it's a real opportunity. Uh, and the fact that I can help young people have the same sort of experience uh, is amazing. It's tremendous. You know, who gets that kind of opportunity? Um, the worst thing about it is that, you know, you, you can't half-ass starting a business or enterprise organization. Um, you have to be really committed 
And so now I'm on the road a lot and I have two young kids and, you know, it's a little bit harder now to travel if you, you know, you're not seeing your kids as much. So that, that's one thing that I struggle with a little bit. And another thing, uh, at least for me now, is that your role adapts to what the organization needs. And so there are things that you do, you can't be excited about every aspect of, 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 of your work. And so, um, you know, like there are times when you just uh, find yourself just having to knock things out because you know that's what the organization needs. What behaviors and traits do you look for when you're hiring people for your own organization and for your leadership team? Uh, well, certainly in our organization, character is a huge deal, a uh, high level of integrity. Um, you know, you cannot have um, people who are going to uh, be effective role models for the next generation of young, young person, you know, if you have any misgivings on that level. So character is number one. Um, in Venture for America's case, I'm happy to say we've had incredible people come work for us because it's such an appealing mission. I mean, who doesn't want to uh, train the next generation of entrepreneur and revitalize the country? I mean, we get like a lot of really talented people that are excited about that. But when you have a relatively small team the way we do, culture is all important. And so there, there needs to be someone who fits in well with the team um, and will be uh, like a positive uh, addition uh, to preserve the culture. Tell us more about culture. How do you build a culture for the organization that you've created? A lot of culture gets determined just by your um, actions. One of the things that I've seen over time is that um, it's like being a parent a little bit where it doesn't matter really what you say, it just matters what you do. Like you can say like, hey, you know, don't look at your iPhone all day and then if you just sit there and look at your iPhone in front of your kid all day, they'll be like, hey, you know, I guess that's, you know, what I'm going to do. <laughs> so the, the way company cultures get built um, uh, uh, from the leader's, uh, the CEO's point of view is really what the CEO spends time on. Um, you know, if the CEO says, hey, you know what's really important? Spending time with their family, but then like I sat in the office like around the clock 24-7 and then like people would feel pressure to like, be there and, and the rest of it. So you kind of have to be like, okay, like family's important. I'm gonna go home to my family. <laughs> you know, feel free. So a, a lot of it's really just like um, trying to lead by example um, and bring on people that reflect what you're going for. And when you get it wrong, because everyone gets it wrong, when you get it wrong, just own up to it. Um, I, you know, Dan Gilbert's a, another um, friend and mentor to Venture for America. And Dan said something that really I agree with wholeheartedly. It's like whenever you start having doubts as to whether there's a fit, it's never going to work out. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and you should make that move as fast as possible. And he said that um, he's been in business now for decades and built literally billion dollar businesses. And he says that like he's never once made the move too soon. He's always made the move too late. Like he's always let it linger for too long. Do you plan on starting any other businesses? You know, uh, so one, one of the things about entrepreneurship, too, is that you can't leave anything half done. And Venture for America has so much potential and so much work to do that I, I see myself being in this role, helping us achieve our potential for years and years to come. Um, and, and I'm not one of these types of entrepreneurs who can somehow do 20 things. Uh, you know, I, I can only do um, a couple things, <laughs> I'd say. So I do love businesses. Uh, it's incredibly gratifying to see some of our fellows and alums start companies and like I love being helpful to them. It's, it's uh, in some ways the best part of my job. So I love businesses, I love growth companies, I love startups and I certainly would never say never. But you know I've got a job to do right now and, and there's a lot of work to do. Well this was great Andrew, thank you so much for joining us today. No problem. And that's it for today. We'll see you next time on Sardar TV.